So now it's seven thirty. At uh, seven thirty sharp, because uh, we cannot wait, and there is already people who joined. So uh, welcome again for our second, uh, uh, let's say, webinar talk. Uh, you can frame it the way you want based on what you are learning from all of these. So uh, as you know, tonight it's going to be um, the topic is climate change. And we'll be having um, two speakers. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, Wafa, and the second one is Monica. Uh, tonight, uh, we will be speaking in English. So um, the webinar will be in English. And I would love and I would prefer like everyone to have the questions in English because you will see uh, we have the same. Monica is, um, does not speak Arabic. So um, we will start with you, Wafa. So I'm going to give you a very quick introduction. Wafa, uh, Wafa is a Tunisian and she works as a climate change consultant for the H uh, HBS Tunis Foundation. Uh, she will um, she will share with us some concrete examples on uh, climate uh, change actions she's working on. And uh, a quick side note, um, uh, Wafa, she was uh, one of uh, the previous attendees of uh, the, uh, the training program that we did. It wasn't online because there was no COVID. But uh, you will see how, uh, how active you could uh, be, what would be the impact of, uh, of this uh, training on you and how you can move forward with a new community. So um, same as last time, this time we'll have 20 minutes for Wafa, another 20 minutes for Monica, and at the end, we will have all the Q&A. So please uh, write them uh, on, on the side if, uh, and we will, we will get back to, to all your questions. So Wafa. It is mm. all yours. Hi, everyone. I'm just trying to share my screen before starting. Um, OK, now, now start sharing it. I think now you can do it. OK. I'm not sure that I'm allowed to share my screen. You are, maybe. There. Yeah. Try. Uh, can you now? Um, Ah, voilà. D'accord. So, can you guys see the presentation? Just give us, give us a moment. Mm -hmm. In the process. So. Okay, here it is. You can see. Nice. Okay. Before starting, so hello again, everyone. Um, um, thank you uh, for the presentation. Um, as I was saying, I'm, um, I'm from Tunisia. I'm an uh, environmental activist. Um, I work on climate change as a climate change consultant with uh, the office of um, HBS uh, Tunis. And uh, this year, I work also as um, in charge of local climate action uh, project with my colleague, uh, Anna. Um, as this is saying, I'm uh, going to use the English language instead of Arabic uh, for this webinar, um, since Monica is in here and um, it's more practical for her. 
Uh, so before starting, I would like to uh, to thank my my colleague Cecil and Ailey for uh, this opportunity, of course, and uh, for um, the OD uh, organization um, that I had um, the pleasure to to meet them in uh, Beirut uh, with the Arab Youth uh, for uh, um, Education for Sustainable Development in 2017. Uh, so since today, uh, side event is um, on the climate change uh, challenges and uh, the potential roadmaps uh, to make um, a possible uh, solution, I'm going to focus on uh, this year's project. As I said, or shown here at the presentation, is under the name of Local Climate Action Project. Um, so um, before uh, presenting the project, I'm trying to, to uh, I'll try to uh, uh, present a little bit of the um, uh, Tunisia climate change profile. So, um, for uh, the climate change in Tunisia, as it's impacting all uh, of the region, but uh, for our case in Tunisia, uh, for um, if we want to talk about the matter of uh, the green, uh, greenhouse gas emission, uh, we're responsible for only 0.07% uh, of the world's uh, total uh, gas and uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission. Uh, the date of the signature of uh, the, um, uh, the famous um, Paris, um, uh, Paris uh, Protocol or uh, the Agreement for Climate Change, if some of you uh, may know it, is the um, uh, 22nd of April 2016. And the date of uh, ratification by the Assembly of uh, People Representative, uh, Tunisian People Representative, it was in the 10th of February 2017. And uh, unfortunately, until now, it's not uh, implemented yet. Uh, so, getting back for uh, the whole uh, Mediterranean region, uh, according to the IPCC, it's the, the fifth uh, IPCC, uh, IPCC report, it's uh, the anti governmental. Uh, climate change report for experts, um, they recall that the Mediterranean basin is a hotspot of climate change. So it's scientifically proved that it's a hotspot of climate change, which should mean any uh, temperature addition, degrees addition for uh, uh, the, the globe is going to be more, more intense for the, the basin of Mediterranean uh, area. And uh, it's also been mentioned that the prospect of sustainable development of Mediterranean society uh, will be strongly affected in the coming years by the impact of climate change. So we're talking about a serious threat, a threat for uh, the area of the Mediterranean uh, basin, specifically as is shown here in the map, uh, the northern um, part of uh, the African continent, which is include Morocco, Algeria, uh, and Tunisia also from uh, the south area of uh, the basin. <clears throat> Here we have, an, uh, we follow the NDC, the national, uh, nationally determined contribution. It's um, the national engagement of uh, Tunisia. Uh, here submitted on the year of 2015 during uh, the COP21, the Conference of Parties uh, related to climate change 21, where we have the, uh, the Paris Agreement that this document represents engagement of Tunisia and Metro climate change nationally. So uh, we've been engaged to mitigate as, as a measure of, uh, of climate change to fight uh, climate change. We've been, um, uh, we've been, we, we had to have um, measures to mitigate and to adapt to climate change. Uh, the mitigation was related to uh, mainly uh, the following uh, sectors, the energy sector, the industry sectors, uh, land use and forest sector, agriculture uh, sector, was, uh, waste of uh, solid waste and liquid sector. And also for the adaptation measures were taken for uh, with the, the water resources, coastal area, agriculture, ecosystem, health and tourism sector. Here we see that is mentioned twice for the mitigation measures and adaptation measures of the sector of agriculture. We call it the cross-cutting um, sector because it, um, it includes for uh, the mitigation and adaptation measure at the same time. So after um, or what's mentioned in uh, the NDC, the Tunisian NDC, um, these are of the following uh, 
the climate and other matter problems in Tunisia that the different region of Tunisia is suffering from are the scarcity of water resources, deforestation, gentrification, the high sea level, because we have a multitude of islands in Indonesia, the waste management, it's a huge challenge uh, for uh, gas emission in Tunisia, and also the pollution, atmospheric, anthropological, and aquatic pollution. So here, um, after this presentation of uh, the climate change profile of Tunisia, that leads us to have uh, this kind of project on the local level, because the challenges is really, really big, really um, serious, but it's not implemented or working on all the local level. So from here, we have this idea to work on uh, climate change policies, but with municipalities. Since in 2014, with the new regime in Tunisia, we are talking about decentralization and uh, the authority on the local level with the municipalities. So we decided to have this project in partnership with uh, the foundation of uh, Einrich Paul in Tunis. So this project is a part of international communities that call it to involve the cities in climate change. Um, to uh, involve the city in uh, the climate action line. <clears throat> to contribute to, to national efforts to combat, uh, to combat against of climate uh, change through structured dialogue with different local authorities uh, at the city, with the other, also with the other cities and with uh, uh, the local uh, NGOs, the private sector, uh, all uh, the local actors in the city. So I'm going to present the different uh, steps of uh, uh, the project is um, uh, mainly the project timeline. <clears throat> so at first we started by choosing the municipality. Uh, this project is covering only um, four municipalities, so we're going to try with them. Uh, the, this idea of the project, so if we're going to have like good results or, or a positive result, we will try to uh, include other uh, municipalities next year. <clears throat> so uh, with the four municipalities, we, the, two, or, uh, the way or the process of choosing the, uh, those uh, four municipalities are um, they were selected according to a criteria of uh, climate change vulnerability and risk of uh, exposure to natural disasters. Um, and the rate of uh, the municipal performance evaluation that was published by the Minister of Local Affairs at 2018. <clears throat> so uh, next step of uh, the project was meeting with local uh, authorities, the different uh, local uh, actors, including local authorities. It was like meeting, uh, having a meeting with local actors, uh, representative of municipalities also, uh, minister structure the re on the regional level, uh, private sector, civil society who uh, should be involved all together in the local climate action. Uh, in order to prepare um, all of them to gather the local, uh, in order to gather all of them to prepare a local climate uh, plan. This meeting was aiming to mobilize, uh, to mobilize uh, the different uh, actors to involve them in a climate uh, action on the local level. So our first meeting here um, with the first municipality that we selected was uh, it's uh, the municipality of uh, Bouselem and um, as um, shown here is the map is the northwest area of uh, Tunis. Um, just mentioning that uh, Bouselem here is a part of uh, the governor of uh, Jandouba. Uh, here was our first meeting with uh, the other different members of uh, the municipality of Bouselem. Then also we had a meeting with the second municipality in uh, the northern area of uh, Tunis and Benzard, uh, the municipality of uh, Matip. Then in the center we, we selected the municipality of uh, Matip in Spekus. Hello, could you hear me guys? I think. 
Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. So, um, as, uh, as I've been saying, um, our third uh, uh, municipality, he was in the municipality of Mahrez in uh, Sfiqas, is in the center of uh, Tunis. Then the last one was the municipality of uh, Jerba Ejim in the island of uh, Jerba. And um, during the, uh, the process of meeting uh, local authorities, uh, unfortunately, it happened. Uh, it was under the COVID-19 condition, so we had to do this meeting uh, online with the, the heads of the municipality and um, uh, uh, the planner of the municipality. So the next step of the project is having a meeting with the planner. Who's the planner? We try to, to find, um, we call it the keystone of the project, and we name it the, the focal point, uh, um, climate change focal point of the municipality. Uh, it must be basically uh, with the profile of planner, urbanist, or architect, because um, he is supposed to be responsible of developing the strategies, action, and plans on the municipality. So this meeting with the planner was, um, uh, to involve uh, the planners of the four municipalities all together uh, to, um, uh, to, to support their roles in the municipality and to try to help them and to support their ro roles in implementing the climate agendas uh, on the local level and on the municipality level. So we had a, meet we had a meeting with them here in Tunis, in the capital, um, it was our first meeting with the four planner to explain for them the climate agenda, how can they impl um, implement the, the climate agenda in order to uh, achieve or to, to prepare for a local climate, uh, uh, climate plan with the municipality and with the other local actors. And uh, <clears throat> during uh, our first meeting with the planners, we try to uh, identify and the prioritize the urgent city, uh, the urgent or uh, the, uh, the urgency for uh, the, each city in matter of climate change vulnerabilities. So, um, as shown you here, that was an exercise with the planners to identify the high risk vulnerabilities of climate change vulnerabilities with each municipality. Um, as shown here for the municipality of Guisalem, um, the, um, the risk of uh, you know, this was the high risk for, uh, for the municipality of Guisalem, the municipality of Mahasi from uh, the sanitation problem uh, for matter, uh, also sanitation problem uh, and uh, water resources, and for the municipality of Jerba Ajim, uh, the coastal area, and also. Um, uh, fishing and uh, local activities of fishing for uh, for Jerba Ejim was really high and uh, risked with the climate change. Then, after preparing the planners and having the meeting with the planners, understand better, understanding better my, uh, problems with uh, the planners and um, proceeding identification of other local actors with them. Since they the key of the project and they know better the, their own locality, we moved to uh, having uh, capacity building workshops. Those capacity building workshops they were dedicated for the local uh, actors, uh, which means the municipalities, the planners themselves, uh, NGOs, um, uh, private sector, public sector, <coughs> to capacity their uh, to building their capacities in matter of uh, climate agendas and also climate finance. So, um, so it was uh, an opportunity to bring all the local actors together, um, uh, to bring all the, uh, together the various, uh, various uh, local actors with the planners to strengthen their, their own capacity on matter of climate change, as I said, and to implement um, and how to implement the climate agenda on the local level altogether uh, also to have an idea on the climate finance and access to climate finance. So the output of the project, here was uh, the first uh, workshop in, uh, in Sfiqas, 
uh, with the municipality of Motor. So we, the, each, each workshop on two days, we prepare, we prepare on two days. The first day was only um, dedicated for uh, uh, clarifying climate agendas and uh, the local problems based on the identified um, uh, climate change uh, vulnerability for each uh, municipality. Then the second day was building on the pro identified the problem, how to uh, find uh, an adequate for climate finance for each problem <clears throat> in order to prepare a local climate plan altogether. Uh, That's our uh, second workshop in Zerba. Then we had the workshop in Denver. And here also during the um, COVID-19 situation, um, apparently on um, 27th of uh, August, uh, the municipality of uh, Brusselum and Janduba, they identified some uh, active cases of COVID, so they had to postpone the workshop. So it's, um, uh, it didn't take place, and it's going to be tomorrow here in Tunis. Uh, we're trying to bring them to Tunis to work for, uh, to try and work out the, uh, the workshop of uh, the municipality of Bucela. <clears throat> uh, during the workshop, we had, um, we've been uh, really honored to have the, the, the support of uh, the Green Climate Fund uh, representative of Tunisia and uh, uh, the, the Designed National uh, Authority. Uh, to support our work for the second day of the workshop to um, help uh, the municipality and the municipality and the local authority how to um, have an access to uh, uh, climate finance based on uh, the local uh, project and the local plan they have the local actors that they aiming to have and and to to, to, to implement in their localities <clears throat> the next step of uh, the project that we're trying to, to, to reach now, since it's really, uh, really late uh, due, uh, due to, uh, to the COVID-19 situation, that um, the output of this project is going to be a guide for, uh, for the municipalities or for other municipalities to have, to have or, uh, uh, a local climate plan. Uh, it's going to be uh, this guide based on the experience of the four um, qualities that we're working on this or working with this year. Also, uh, it's supposed to be uh, uh, it's supposed to be a platform of climate profile for each municipality to uh, present their work, their local work, um, in order to increase the transparency of uh, the project and the finance of each municipality. We found it as a need during the workshop. So uh, that's it. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so um, thank you. Thank you, Wafa, for presenting such a um, uh, tangible example and with all the connectivity working on different levels with many stakeholders and uh, reaching out to a concrete example, which is something very important, or let's say to a concrete action plan. Um, now for, for the questions, please uh, keep them till the end. And we're gonna uh, move to another example with Monica. Hello, Monica. So um, Monica is, um, as you saw, Monica is as Chief Executive Officer at the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizen, and uh, she's passionate uh, for change maker. Uh, she's an advocate, founder, and speaker, uh, and she will be presenting another uh, project. So, uh, Monica. Thanks so much, Cecile. Pleasure to be here. Wafa, thanks for your insights. It was really informative how one country is tackling it. And then first and foremost, kudos to all of you out there because it's late in your countries. I'm sure that you had an intensive day like I did, and yet you are here and care for the environment and climate change. So chapeau to all of you. Thanks for switching to English. Uh, I'm not versed in Arabic, and I want to get straight into my presentation because I have a lot that I want to introduce you to. First, I want you to leave my 20 minutes that I have um, able to debunk certain climate myths. 
Secondly, I want you to leave the 20 minutes to have an informed assessment of what is the challenge that we have globally. And I know that sounds maybe a bit aloof, but I think it's important to have that information to know what we should do in our everyday life. And third, I would like to present you solutions. And fortunately, there are other far more renowned centers than mine that have worked on it tirelessly. And I want to give you glimpses of hope because we are not all doomed yet. And I do hope, can you see Wafa and, and Cecile? I see you on my screen still. Can you see my slideshow already? Is that shared? Perfect. Yes. So then off we go. So these two gentlemen, maybe one of them is known to you, probably the right hand gentleman here, Ban Ki-moon, they are my bosses. And I have the privilege and pleasure to lead the Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens for the two. The one on the left side is Heinz Fischer. He is the president of Austria, the former president of Austria. And these two gentlemen happen to be friends because they sequentially moved up in the ranks, one in national politics, the other one in international politics. And they made it their goal to empower youth and women. And not only to do that, but to do that in the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals and of the Paris Climate Agreement that Wafa already mentioned. And I'm almost certain that many of you know the Paris Climate Agreement, and yet, when I am asked by climate skepticists, um, so, but warming has happened before, it's not worse than it was, um, yes, and all of this carbon emission talk that is happening, it's, it's natural that we have carbon emission, and anyway, nature takes care of it. So whenever I'm confronted with these kind of accusations, I obviously know the argument against it, but I experience in my circle of friends and even in my family that many of the myths are not debunked. So these two gentlemen said, let's debunk the myths and let's do that because we don't have a plan B, we don't have a planet B, we need to do it now. The method to do it, and I hope that my slideshow continues. Um, no, it actually doesn't. Oh yeah, it does, okay. So the method to do that is the roadmap of the Sustainable Development Goals. I hope that all of you know them. And of course, goal 13 is the one that uh, we want to focus on today, the one on climate action. But needless to say that all of them are linked. You cannot achieve one without achieving the other. And that's pertaining to quality education. That's pretty much what we are doing tonight here. But equally well to gender equality. And I will get to the point why I now, with climate change, particularly put an emphasis on gender equality. So, these two guys, maybe you remember that picture that went around the world, Ban Ki-moon, Laurent Fabius, and then Ségolène Royal and Hollande at that time, being very happy in the year 2015 about we have achieved the unbelievable compromise on the Paris Climate Agreement. That was the picture that went around the world on the, in the newspapers. And that was another picture that happened in 2015. It was the diplomats of the UN in New York clapping because the Sustainable Development Goals were finally agreed. And ladies and gentlemen, to be honest, to have these two compounds, these two composite documents, is absolutely incredible. We cannot imagine right now that the world could get together to find this compromise. So given the situations of the Trumps, the Bolsonaros, the Duertes, the you name it in the world, we wouldn't get there now. So we, I think, need to treasure them and need to understand them and be ready to defend them. So what do we defend? What we defend is actually, a, of course, a temperature goal. I called this slide temperature goal. What you see is the earth has fever, and indeed we already are in the stages of fever, because we try with the Paris Climate Agreement to hold the increase of global average temperature to well below two degrees of pre-industrial levels. Would we have more time? I would ask you what are pre-industrial levels. I give it away right away. Pre-industrial means before 1850. So temperature rise below the two degrees Celsius and pursuing the efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 above pre-industrial levels, recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. So fair enough, I'm sure many of you have heard that formulation. What we need to recall is the 1.5, trickier than expected. So oh, I'm flicking back and forth with my presentation. So this one, the long-term goal therefore is um, a one that we want soon, as soon as possible to peak in greenhouse gas emissions. We want to balance the emissions that are anyway sunk naturally with those that we are creating as humankind. And effectively, this means that we need to reach net zero emissions, emission neutrality, 
after 2050. It will be a tough one to reach, I tell you already now, but let me give you the reasons why. And I think, Cecile, I, you are, you're constantly getting the people in in the waiting room. I see that, so I will not bother about it anymore and concentrate on the presentation. Financially, okay. this needs to be backed uh, by, by, of course, money. So there is a legal obligation put particularly on the developing countries in that Paris Agreement. And you see that I underlined the 100 billion per year as a floor. And it, the, the treaty itself includes a provision that prior to 2025, countries should agree to a new collective quantified goal from the floor of 100 billion per year. That's the aspiration. You can imagine we are totally falling short of it. Needless to say, we need to roll up our sleeves to get more money. And then two, um, Wafa already very well explained the NDCs, so the natural, na nationally determined contributions, so what countries offer themselves to do in matters of climate change. So all of these terms I'm hopeful you're familiar with. When it comes to ratification, where do we stand? We are talking about 189 states and the European Union, and they, luckily, represent almost 97% of global greenhouse gas emissions, and all of them ratified or acceded to the agreement. But we also know about the problem of the United States. Trump literally is stepping out of it and is ripping it apart, and we know that too little is done still to actually achieve our goals. What Wafa also alluded to is that often the climate change debate is seen in two realms. And one realm is very much the one on mitigation and the other one is the realm on adaptation. Because how much we will be able to tackle climate change will be determined by exactly these two factors. So how much will our emissions increase and continue? And how can our climate system respond to those emissions? So we are talking about two groups, mitigation, adaptation. They're a bit, they're not at war, but it's of course a competition of them. Some say that 80% of the funds go to mitigation and only 20 to adaptation. So there are now increasing efforts to make, to raise the awareness on adapting our societies. Floods that are washing away the lands, droughts that are killing harvests, um, pretty much you name it. So everything that we are already confronted with to, um, to fight climate change. Now, first myth. Many people argue, but come on, carbon emissions, carbon emissions are good for nature because carbon emissions actually allow that the trees are blossoming. We all know they are living off that kind of fuel. So the straightforward analogy would be more carbon emissions, the better, great. But actually this analogy obviously is wrong and everyone who claims that has not paid attention to any kind of uh, science. In the global carbon cycle, what we do have though, and here you see a figure of the billion of gigatons that are naturally absorbed by the oceans and by vegetation. And you see it's incredible numbers. So we have 439 that are, for example, emitted just by the simple bio circles, the cycles that we are witnessing, but then also how much is absorbed. And actually we do get a bit of a benefit balance as human beings, but what we do is due to fossil fuel burning and land use and other reasons, there are two that are exemplified, uh, approximately 29, actually now recent studies say rather 36 gigatons are emitted in addition to the natural global carbon cycle. And that means we are in big trouble. Big trouble because even another myth that is often quoted is, come on, we had CO2 level increases over the past 10,000 years, we had temperature increases over the past 10,000 years. But if you're looking at, at the actual uh, particles and the atmospheric CO2 that are measured in ppm, so parts per million, you see that right now in the 2000s, we enter the phase unprecedented. And when you read Taylor Dome, Law Dome and Mauna Loa, these were probes that scientists took to compare the PPM levels in the various uh, surf, like in the, in the ground level. So um, furthermore, when you are asked, okay, but I am, uh, I'm not responsible for carbon emissions. So hence it is others that are. When you look at this chart, it is true that after the industrial, like pre, yeah, the, the 1850s uh, cessation kind of uh, date, after that, we literally skyrocketed with our 
total annual CO2 emissions by world region. And what you see is that the EU is responsible for quite some share, the US also, the Americas less so, the Middle East comparable to the Americas, Africa, although it's such a big continent bearing the vastest population currently, very little. India on the rising scale, China, a massive chunk. And then you have Asia and Pacific and others, and then also international transport was taken off because obviously it's a, it's a nexus kind of issue. And then statistical differences, this is exactly what alludes to, first I told you the number of 29 billion tons, here you have suddenly 35 billion tons. So statistics vary because obviously these are approximations. So this, if you want to tackle the issue, you need to be clear about the data who is responsible for what and without scapegoating or blame shaming, this is the reality. The other reality that we need to be aware of is, so how does actually CO2, our global greenhouse gas emissions, not only CO2, so I have to be accurate here, global greenhouse gas emissions that are responsible for the uh, greenhouse effect that we have, the global warming. So which sectors do they come from? And you have quarter in electricity and heat production, quarter in agriculture, forestry, and other land use, 6% buildings, 14% transportation, 21% industry, and then other energy sources. It's an interesting statistic because often people claim wrong things and it's all down to industry, it's not, or it's all down to agriculture, it's not. It's like in, in the mix of these things. So the biggest emitters, no surprise there, China, US, India, Russia, Japan, Germany lead the scale and hence their responsibility of course is an ever bigger one. Doesn't mean that the others are let off the hook, quite on the contrary, because if we don't work together on this, we will not manage. So what are the global greenhouse gas emissions by gas? Many say it's a myth that it's only CO2. And you will hear many climate skeptics who say, CO2 is such a tiny portion of our atmosphere. How can this one component be detrimental to our overall climate? But if you do the crunching of the numbers, you see that carbon dioxide is particularly responsible because of fossil fuel and industrial processes and forestry and other land use. So almost 76% are actually of the greenhouse gas effect are are carbon dioxide triggered, but also methane and nitrous oxides and F gases are responsible. F gases, you have to imagine, are those that are in refrigerators. Um, methane, you know, is cattle breeding, but not only that, but it's also land use and other things that emit methane. So that's an argument for a plant rich diet. And nitrous oxides are fertilizers, literally. So much goes to, to agricultural processes, but also the F gases, when you're looking at heat pumps or cooling devices, air conditions, they are even worse because of their small proportion than CO2. And if we could just get these 2% right, we would actually be uh, way ahead. So um, the SDGs, and I will not go into the detail of SDG 13 for the sake of time, but literally do know that SDG 13 is probably a bit more lax than the Paris Climate Agreement, but it's totally compatible and both of them reinforce one another. And obviously um, the, the obligations, the reporting obligations that country have, the countries have under this and that are pretty similar. Yet the Paris Climate Agreement has legal obligations. SDGs are merely a voluntary kind of agreement of the world. Um, SDGs also have a component of, for example, improving education and awareness raising in one of the sub goals of the SDGs. And this is exactly what we are doing. So I hope that after my talk, some of you will retain some of the arguments and be able to debunk certain myths. So it is true that I, lo I love this graphic because the SDGs, this is the SDGs again, the 17 goals, and yet it is um, visible here that it's all in a system. You can't isolate one and hope that it's fulfilled, but rather the biosphere ones, so climate change, life on land, water and sanitation, are something like the, the basis on which we can put our societal and economic considerations. And of course, it's important to tackle the others at the same time. But if we don't get that challenge right, yeah, we are pretty not fine off. Maybe some of you have seen this graphic that COVID-19 right now in the news, far and wide, everyone is observing COVID-19 and be sure to wash your hands and all will be well is a bit of a hmm, interesting uh, 
caricature here, you have the second wave, the recession that is looming, the economic crisis that many of us are already affected by. But then the wave that is overarching that is actually climate change. To me, this, this picture is very telling. And hence, again, thanks to all of you who in times of crisis are still looking at the biggest wave, are still looking at our environmental challenges and climate change, because uh, otherwise COVID-19 um, too will, will be, it is massive and yes, we have to tackle it, but scale is the key here. So we have greenhouse gas concentrations that have increased. Global temperature has risen. Here you have got the data. The oceans are more acid than ever. Global warming has increased. The stats are absolutely a proof of that. The sea levels continue to rise. Adaptation becomes more important for countries that are the small island states and countries that are below sea level. And also we are seeing the Arctic melt. That's all very gloomy and the extreme weather events are increasing, deaths are increasing. So the, the data is there and whoever cares for finding it will find it. This is something that is done by, um, this is basically a summary of all that I have said. And yes, it's full of numbers, but these numbers are ex extremely telling. When you go to the very left of the slide, you see that in between the years of 1850 to 1999, we have emitted 10, uh, 1,010 gigatons of CO2 altogether. In just the 15 years between 2000 and 2015, we have emitted half of that only in these 15 years. And scientists calculated that our carbon budget that we still have is actually 335 gigatons. Now, you have seen on the slides before that approximately 35, 36 gigatons are emitted in addition to the natural carbon cycle every year. And that gives us a sort of a time frame of eight more years that we can tackle the, the things that are, that are out there. Now, in the ground, what is left to release in carbon, uh, in CO2, you see is lots of reserves. And here we are talking the oil that is that is there. So the ground still bears hell of a lot more of what we can safely release. So eight more years. What will happen if we don't manage the two degrees? Uh, let's focus on the line like on the middle seg segment of this. So let's say we have a temperature increase of two degrees. What will be the scenario? It's still a safe limit. That's at least what IPCC says. The sea levels will have risen uh, to 1.4 meters. We have, for example, cities like Amsterdam, and I should have adapted it to your region. Sorry, I didn't have the time for that. But we will have drowning cities all over the globe. We will have the corals bleached, the heat every Euro summer, like every in Europe, there would be a summer heat wave, and it would be even worse in your region. And then corn and wheat yields would be reduced by 20%. Maybe some of you, while I was talking, were looking at the scenarios of plus three or plus four or plus five and plus six. We are talking about nightmarish scenarios. Now, gloomy picture. Fortunately, I'm finally shifting to the solutions because they are out there. And whoever of you doesn't yet know Project Drawdown, please Google it. Uh, watch their TED Talks. They are highly entertaining. Um, go on their website. They have distilled the 100 solutions to reverse global warming by 2050. Those solutions already exist and they do always put the emphasis on we can't focus on just one, we really need to tackle all of them. And some of them might be quite surprising to you as they were to me when I ventured into that subject matter. Two of them that I want to highlight are those that are in brown in the middle of the slide and I hope you can see it. One is number six in the ranking of the most effective solutions, and it's educating girls. And the other one is family planning, number seven. And that might strike you as counterintuitive because we constantly hear about the windmills, the solar panels, the, the reduction of food waste, and all of that is valid. But let me show you something that was surprising to me on the next slide. If these 100 solutions are put into a pie chart, and this pie chart is the goal of reducing global warming, what you see is that some areas are simply more effective than others if calculated by the gigatons of CO2 or uh, nitro oxides or methane or the F gases that you can draw down from the environment, draw down from the atmosphere. So what you see is 
refrigeration, would we get all of our air conditioning, recycling and production and all of our um, refrigeration right? We would do a tremendous lot for the environment. There is a Kigali protocol, Kigali protocol, for those of you who don't know it, please check it out. It will only become um, punchy and uh, like sort of enforced, hopefully, in 2024. So still four years to go and actually we don't have that time. What you also see, wind turbines and those onshore make quite a difference. Reducing food waste and plant-rich diet, if you count these two uh, segments together, it's a massive uh, eff like effect for our uh, global situation. And then yet, and it doesn't look like it, it's graphically a bit misleading, but educating girls and family planning, if you take those two together, is the biggest chunk, the biggest single chunk that you could do um, against global warming. And that might be surprising, but what's behind it is that we as population are increasing and we have not yet reached the peak. So population increase is factored in there. And the moment you educate girls and the moment you allow them to family plan, we are better off as society because um, exponential growth of human population subsides. What's also known is that the more educated girls are, the higher the chance they become leaders in their communities, in businesses, in certain sectors. And what is also known is that ladies have a tendency to reinvest money into environmental friendly measures more than men. So factoring all of this in, of course, it's a long haul goal, but counterintuitive, educating girls and family planning is one of our best tools that we have to draw down CO2 from the atmosphere. And there are studies on it and Project Drawdown can give you the, the crunching of the numbers. And because I have, I think, used my 20 minutes, let me just flick through some of the Project Drawdown amazing slides that they have given to us. Thank you for, for spreading in the world. Family planning, although it's ranked of all of the solutions, only seventh, refrigeration is number one, but seventh is family planning could reduce gigatons per year, 51.48. Um, refrigeration, I had to do fair credit to refrigeration, ranked number one, would reduce um, up to 90 gigatons of CO2 and the cost yet, the, the net savings would be incredible. Cost also is quite high for this whole reprocessing. Wind turbines offshore, for example, only get ranked 22. Um, reduced food waste gets rank three because of the gigatons that could be reduced by, by just getting rid of food waste. Shifting to a plant-rich diet, rank four, not bad at all on its own. Um, forest protection, only rank 38. But again, ladies and gentlemen, my argument is not that we should only focus on the top three, we should focus on all of them. But be aware, if your time span is limited, where do you want to dedicate your time to? And I find Project Drawdown very informed and very interesting because it's scientifically done and the methodology is very sound. So that leaves me with the last point. There are many opportunities for action, of course, in electricity, food and agriculture, transportation, industry building, cities, materials, but also, and this is my point of this talk today, public health and education population and empowering women and girls. And this is part of what the Ban Ki-moon Center does. So thank you very much for your attention and for giving me, I think, a bit more time than was um, allotted to me. Not that much. So thank you so much, Monica. Um, now we're gonna start with the questions. And uh, in case someone would love not to write on the chat and to ask, um, because we are here as well to interact, this is why we are using Zoom. So for those who would love to ask, just raise your hand, use the, um, uh, you have, there's a button within uh, Zoom where you can raise your hand and we can have you one question by the other. But now, uh, Monica, we have, uh, Anura is asking, how do we make people know the importance of climate change and how it affects on migration and public interests? I have to switch my audio on again. Excellent question. How do we make them aware? Um, I think many of us see the effects of climate change already. And I know from my own experience that I need to do that talk, not only in my circle of family members, but also my circle of friends, my universities that I'm connected to. I have the privilege of, of course, working with major multipliers, like, for example, the NGO Global Citizen or the Scouts Movement. 
And Ban Ki-moon's goal is that every child that is educated within the next 10 years knows about not only the SDGs, but also knows about the, the necessity of tackling climate change. It's a tough call. We are working with UNESCO, and I mean, all of you are part of the UNESCO network to a certain extent, to enshrine that into the curricula of primary, secondary, and tertiary education. If you ask me, so that's top down. So that's what, what we are engaged in and what we are trying to do and what many organizations are trying to do. Bottom up, <laughs> be the change that you want to see in the world. And ODD, like the, the NGO ODD for me is an example of having members who really care for how much plastic do I use every day? How many masks did I waste during the COVID crisis? How many do I need? Where can I do my share in recycling um, stuff? And I know, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard, but Beirut, obviously all of you have heard what kind of craziness was, was happening in these past couple of, of months. And I know that Odd uh, tried to recycle and yet when they separated in days of work, all of the compartmentalized sort of materials, glass and metal and whatnot, the army went in and, and shoved it all together again. And these efforts, guys and ladies are how to say they are frustrating and yet they are so necessary because by doing it on the street by by making a move you are raising awareness and you are lighting up igniting maybe some sparks in others so even by planting your own small garden patch you are making a difference and as ludicrous as it might sound do it so that's the best answer i can give you and it's an emotional one because literally it's in in our hands Exactly. So, um, as well, uh, this is what I'm going to ask you for both of you, for you, Monica, and then for Wafa, because we, you are working with as well on action plans. As well as asking how to spread this awareness, which is quite a bit same to the, to the previous one, but uh, and what what are the actions that the country must take to to save the planet? Is it for me or for Wafa? Uh, if you want, just start with you and then we'll move to work. So you have heard now from me about the Paris Climate Agreement and you have heard about the SDGs. Under both of them, the countries have an obligation to report. Now, many of you can argue, is it worth the paper that it's written on? But I tell you, fortunately, at times it is, because countries are pressured, governments are pressured to submit their nationally determined contributions and their so-called VNRs, Voluntary National Reports, where they have to justify what they have done. And somehow it's a bit of a, uh, of a contest between the nations, and I know some are struggling with other issues at hand, but yet these mechanisms are there to be able to see who needs help on what. In an ideal world, funds would flow to the countries that are really trying to make an effort top down and bottom up and that are not managing because of financial constraints. And fortunately, this is happen at, happening at times. Is it happening enough? Absolutely not. Does private sector need to jump on board? Yes. Does academia need to be totally involved in this? Yes, does every individual, as we are assembled here tonight, need to do our share? Yes, and particularly when it comes to uh, calling governments responsible. Our first, when, when we are the, in the privileged system of a democracy, it's our responsibility to elect those that make the right decisions. Ah, it's a given. But if we are in, in regimes that are maybe not as democratic, then still it is our responsibility to hold governments uh, to, to what they have agreed to in the Paris fr framework. And what we have seen in the past couple of months is Fridays for Future, Earth Uprising. We have seen Black Lives Matter. We have seen all of these movements that are fueled by youngsters, by youth, and they are not, they are not shying away to carry the torch. And we as Ban Ki-moon Center, we are highly supportive of these movements because we truly believe they change something. Like Gandhi managed to liberate India in a peaceful march, um, like the Arab Spring, and some want to call it um, differently and don't want to term Arab Spring, but want to, to phrase it differently. But it did trigger changes. Enough? Surely not. But converging towards a right goal, yes. And maybe Wafa, you have additional comments. 
Thank you, Monica. Thank you for the presentation. It was really, uh, really interesting. Um, for the question of um, how to spread awareness about climate change. Uh, personally, I um, uh, believe all the principle of leaving no one behind. I believe that uh, informing about climate change, um, especially uh, in the case of, of Tunisia, it's really important to reach the different target, the different level of the targets um, to reach for, uh, for um, young people, the older, uh, the elderly, um, kids even, uh, the official uh, uh, representative, uh, the private sector, um, the NGOs but each uh, target with a different way of, uh, of uh, with different way to reach it. Uh, for example, on our work for in um, HBS um, Tunisia, we work for um, Youth for Climate, for example, with uh, the movement of uh, Youth for Climate with, uh, uh, and with other young, uh, uh, young people that work on uh, the climate activism in general, we're trying to reach them with uh, workshops and with uh, local gathering and the regional gathering. Uh, also, with um, uh, during the pandemic, uh, the period of pandemic, we tried uh, to uh, uh, reach them with um, training webinars uh, to uh, train them on a different way of, uh, of climate activism. For the others, uh, like um, officials, a representative, uh, we try to reach them through uh, projects like uh, the local campus project and also the private sector. So we always aim to gather all to fight all together climate change uh, issues. And for um, um, your second question about action to uh, that we must take, I believe it's uh, each country, it's, uh, it should fight climate change, all the countries uh, together, yes, uh, it must be all the countries together, but each country is really aware and must be aware of uh, the climate prior priorities that must take. For example, for, for, for Tunisia, we are not a big emitter of uh, carbon dioxide or the greenhouse uh, em uh, gas emission, we're not a go big emitter, but we, we, we really impacted of climate change uh, effect. So the measures must be taken is adaptive measures. So we need to adapt more uh, to, 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 to the new situation that we're facing. We're having a high risk of, uh, of uh, a different risk actually in Tunisia, as I've been mentioned at the presentation with the sea uh, level rise, deforestation, uh, desertification is really, really, really uh, uh, different with different risks that we're facing. So we need to adapt more. So um, that's why we, we uh, uh, the main objective of our project is to, to go to the localities to identify the climate risk and the urgent climate risks to plan and to reduce those uh, vulnerabilities. Okay. Um, well, as well, Sarah was, uh, Sarah was asking uh, for uh, what are the UNESCO action they are taking? Well, basically, None of us is an UNESCO representative uh, in here. Uh, unless Mona is, is here with us in the call and would love to add uh, anything, I'm, I'm not really sure. But, um, but there's another, um, that we have another question. Uh, Sarah wanted to ask a question, so yes. please Sarah, go ahead. Thank you so much. So thanks a lot, Monica, for being here. And I'm pretty sure you're enlightening so many minds. Um, I speak as a vegetarian who is uh, crazy about planting. Um, I've been living in Germany for some time, so I've kind of adapted some uh, techniques that actually work super well for me. But um, I have a really hard time going back to home um, with this mindset because I tell everyone, in, yeah, I'm vegetarian for health reasons and stuff. And then they're like, how can you not eat meat? Like, you know, and then somehow like implementing a behavioral change is very difficult yeah so i just want to ask if based on your experiences both personal and also professional do you have some tips and tricks on how do you think like mm, you can implement a different behavior in the people you'd like to because you said you, you be the the change you want to be right and that's the best example but somehow yeah. it kind of frustrates me a bit that every time I'm trying to engage, you know, like people around me in my circle, and then I find like this mindset, I'm pretty sure you have to be in a different environment altogether 
to um, get new stimuli and start responding to things. But I was just wondering, based on your background, if there are any, yeah, like tips. Sarah, I feel you because it's similar. <laughs> I, I totally feel you. You can't pretty much um, dictate that people should shift to a vegetarian diet. And if you ask around the globe, what is your favorite cuisine? Many people say uh, the local cuisine, so my national cuisine. Then second rank, I think, is exactly. Italian. And then uh, what's surely also following quite soonish is the Maghreb mashrek. So everyone loves the hummus, the falafel, the taboulet. And actually there's lots of vegetarian dishes that are absolutely delicious from the region. But then uh, also Indian food. And for me, Indian food is the argument because it actually is wonderfully delicious without uh, meat. And then what I challenge my friends to do, I, uh, that, that argue, but I can't live without my bacon, my ham, my chicken, my whatever. I ask them, have you ever killed the animal yourself? And if you haven't, then just please make it your task before you eat your next piece of meat, kill the animal. Go to a farmhouse somewhere, kill the animal and try to really process it in a way that it is, because there is nothing wrong. I think with eating meat, we are uh, to, to a normal extent, like to the extent that we are not exploiting the planet. Um, right now we are exploiting the planet. So many more people need to become vegetarian and need to shift to a plant-rich diet. And actually Project Rodown doesn't say all turn vegetarian, but they say shift to plant-rich because right now the balance is totally tilted. But I challenge them, kill an animal, fish a fish. Don't only go to the supermarket. Don't deprive yourself of this experience of actually sacrificing another life to sustain yours. Um, animal life. Whew. But it, it's, it's really something that hardly anyone takes on as a task. And I understand why. I have not killed an animal in my entire life. And I think I couldn't. So, yeah, thanks for that question. And Cecile, to your, to your point before, um, what does UNESCO do? Uh, great comments have been left in the chat. So for those of you who haven't checked that, so for example, AIDS Dialogue on Aceh will be organized by UNFCCC Secretariat in collaboration with UNESCO. And it will be an in-country coordination among ministries of environment. So that's an interesting one. Then there was another comment that said, check out the UNFCCC topics, education, youth, the events and meetings. So you can click on the link. Then you also see that um, the, the, uh, yeah, the dialogues that are going on, the next one will actually be for Africa and the Middle East on the 28th of October, 2020. So every one of you who is interested in that, find out more about it. Exactly. And as well, um, uh, Eunice is pointing out an idea, and I would love to hear your, uh, your, um, your comments, both of you. He's, he thinks that fixing the refugees and the IDP's issues and helping develop, developing countries and then education and economy is the best solution for climate change, because hungry people will not listen. They will think about the current day only, not about the future, and it's normal because it's, a human, it's the human nature. So what do you think? Yeah. Uh, Wafa, do you want to start or shall I start? I don't really want to. Mm, you can go for it, Monica. I will answer uh, Ola's uh, question. Yeah. The, the refugee migration IDP question currently on the globe is massive. Correct. And it will become worse with climate change ripple effects. Correct. Is it therefore the one thing we should focus on? I'd say it's a very important component, but the world is not black and white. And as much as you can topple my refrigeration or my, my uh, girl's education argument, uh, the challenge is not one-sided. Are you correct in asserting that the, if we don't get that issue right, we will be even worse off? Absolutely. Are you correct in hungry people don't listen? Yes, I'm working quite a bit, even in the, in the field, global citizenship education, GCED, Education for Sustainable Development. And what's often quoted is, and probably you all know it, the Maslow Pyramid. Do you know the Maslow Pyramid of needs? Where you have the basic needs, if they are not met, you don't even consider sort of the, the, upper, the upper levels where the highest one is self-actualization. And yes, I have to admit, I am Austrian. I was born in a country where self-actualization is possible and our basic needs are, are met. Um, and that, of course, gives me a very specific outlook. 
that I, that I, yeah, that I'm stuck with in a way, but I really try to remain not only open, but aware of that kind of privilege. And I do know that the moment you are fighting for your everyday survival, so you are, you're somewhere in your needs assessment, not yet even, <laughs> you're not even yet full of food or of, uh, you don't have shelter or you don't even have the basic provisions of being free of conflict, you are not in a peaceful area, then talking about climate change is ever more challenging. If you don't have anything to eat, why do you care for the climate? So I think hence the owners of responsibility is exactly with the countries as, as I've shown you in the, in the PowerPoint slide show, those that are the biggest emitters of course, the industries, of course, the mobility sector, of course, the countries that have been already living at the expense of the rest of the globe. And hence, um, exactly, we're talking Europe, we're talking the US, we're talking China, Russia. You, you remember the scale of the biggest emitters. Again, does it mean everyone else is off the hook? No. Can it be all solved with migration and IDP and refugee? Uh, I wish, I wish. And yet even there, we are failing as European Union miserably and yeah, big battles to fight. So, um, so Ola was as well asking you about how, how do you make it possible in a country that's a bit like similar to the other, uh, having a multiple tangible economic and political issue as well to pay attention to climate change, especially the lack of knowledge about this topic. I really want to thank Ola for the question. For the question, it's really, really important to question uh, because it's one of uh, the, the big challenges that we face it to, to, for for starting our project is to the stability of uh, uh, the municipalities. And for stabilities, I mean political stability. Since uh, after the Tunisian revolution, and as I said, we had an, um, a new political regime on the local level. Um, we had the new um, the new regime, the new process of the centralization of authority uh, regime. So the, uh, the authorities is for the municipality council, and the, one of the main challenges that we face it was the uh, the stability of the municipality council itself because um, it's a new uh, new new councils after a new uh, and the first election after the revolution so um, many challenges that we uh, that uh, that faced that made us to to to, to change uh, uh, the selection criteria uh, based on uh, the climate vulnerability and uh, the uh, risks uh, natural uh, uh, natural and disaster risks also, we added, um, as I said, um, the municipal uh, selection criteria was, uh, we added the municipal uh, performance evaluation. It's uh, evaluation uh, prepared with uh, the Minister of uh, Local Affairs to uh, evaluate uh, the work of the municipalities based on the transparency of their work, uh, the, the good management of their work, and the sustainability of their work based on the project that uh, municipalities uh, uh, implement uh, on the local level. So we try to, uh, to, to select uh, of the four municipalities that we're working with, uh, um, four municipalities with, with, with the basics in need for, to, to, to be part of the project because we, 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 we were in, in a big need for uh, a stable uh, municipal council to, to, to work with them and to make this project uh, um, uh, to, 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 to proceed the project with them because we are in need to, to exist in a uh, municipal council. Um, and that's why we, we, we guarantee uh, a, a good performance of uh, the municipal council. Also, that, that's why we had to, to uh, prepare during the workshop of uh, the capacity building workshop. It was, that's why it was for two days. The first day, uh, on the capacity building and matter of um, uh, climate agenda, climate agendas, which mean on the, look, um, uh, the international climate agendas um, about the national determined contribution, the national uh, 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 local, um, uh, the national climate engagement uh, uh, on uh, the SDGs and uh, the, object uh, the objective of sustainable development on, on in general on, on the climate agendas and uh, we prepare uh, the needs of each localities. Um, the second day, 
we try to tackle uh, to tackle the the problem the, the problems that all the municipalities uh, suffer from in Tunis. For now, uh, the main problem that the municipalities suffer from is the source of finance to find their uh, project. That's why we try to focus the second day on the climate finance. So we, after identification of the problems, local problems and the need of the municipalities, we switch to the finest uh, resources. That's why we, we try to, um, with, this, uh, with the support of uh, uh, the green climate uh, finance uh, team, uh, Tunisia uh, team, to help the municipalities and the local uh, actors on how to have an access to a climate fi uh, finance through preparing a local climate plan. Thank you, Wafa. Thank you so much. And Salim, uh, I apologize. I didn't know you are here with us as well. So you have, um, you have, you want to reply on UNESCO support and what they are doing. So please. Do so. Thank you, Cecil. And thank you, Monica. And thank you, Wafa. And thank you for everybody for participating. I'm not sure if you are aware that UNESCO has supported member states in integrating climate change into education systems so that learners are equipped with the knowledge, skills, and values to address climate change and contribute to sustainable development more widely. This part is uh, one of the support we are providing on SDG, especially target 4.7, Education for Sustainable Development. It also supports the implementation of Article 6 of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, the article that concerns education, training, public awareness, public access to information, public participation, and international cooperation, in short, ACE. In addition to what I mentioned before, the regional webinar on the ACE Dialogue on Action for Climate Change Empowerment, ACE, will take place on 28 October uh, this year. So you are welcome if you want to participate with that one and see this one will be in cooperation with the UNFCCC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salim. Thank you for attending with us this, uh, uh, this session as well. So um, uh, Sira is, uh, is speaking about an issue in uh, Jordan. Uh, she's saying that they have a salty desert due to climate change and uh, other problems. So how can you solve them? Is it, is it planting crops are, uh, that are resisting to washing land and, uh, and use press precision system? Is it, uh, is it a solution? Do you have any idea, uh, Monica, about this? Yeah, uh, well, am I an agricultural expert? No, but does the Ban Ki-moon Center now more and more venture into exactly what has been raised in this question? We do, because we see the necessity. So the background story to it is that um, there is now something called the Global Commission on Adaptation, which turned into the Global Center of Adaptation. You remember in my slideshow, I showed you there is the mitigation cohort and there is the adaptation cohort, and they of course need to work together. But adaptation is now even has an institutionalized character because the Netherlands, and those of you who speak, speak French know Netherlands are Peiba, like they are the land below water. And they have a massive adaptation problem because the sea levels are rising and so they really need to pour money into protecting their own sovereign territory. And that's uh, what was done with, with the effort not only to do it locally, but the Dutch have, of course, the global perspective saying we will host the Center for Global Adaptation in, Netherland in the Netherlands. Now, in the first years, Ban Ki-moon, together with uh, Bill Gates and Kristalina Georgieva, led the commission that was informing this entity that has uh, really put out tremendous studies that exactly go to the points that were raised in the question studies that show that yes we do need to focus on climate resilient crops and yes we do need to look at uh, targeted drip water irrigation or irrigation systems that are that are environmentally friendly and of course they need to be localized like these solutions need to be absolutely locally palatable so whoever is interested in finding scientific solid material on that please go to the gca the uh, global center on adaptation in the meantime which is now chaired by Ban Ki-moon still so it's one of his many international hats that he has and that we are as Ban Ki-moon center also catering towards together with Feike Sibesma he's a um, former CEO of a big company a Dutch company 
Now, climate resilient crops uh, are also of the, uh, of the importance, particularly for smallholder farmers. And the Ban Ki-moon Center in the next years will have the opportunity to work with big governments and governmental donors to enshrine that principle of climate resilient crops. And I'm not talking those crops that you can plant one year and you have to buy the crop, like the, 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 um, the, the crop again. So Monsanto and uh, help me with the nomenclature. You see, I'm not yet quite there, but we will venture into that field and we will hopefully make a difference, particularly when it comes to major emitters of carbon emissions, that they shift their development cooperation plans and are supporting exactly smallholder farmers in hard stricken territories of sub-Saharan Africa, of uh, the Middle East, of Latin America, of the, the Southeast Asian region, etc., and also water management. So yes, uh, if you want to read more scientifically on it, Global Center for Adaptation, led by Patrick Verkoning, a Dutch guy. Uh, Monica, as well, Mohammed has, uh, has a question for you, please. Mohammed, can you do so? Uh, hi, thank you, Monica, very much for your uh, excellent presentation. Uh, my question is that uh, for people like us in Gaza who live under a uh, Israel, a pressure of the Israeli occupation, when we come to like tell younger men that uh, the idea of green, uh, uh, the climate change and stuff like that, they tell us like, what's the difference? Uh, we, our, we don't make any difference because we are under a pressure and uh, anything we do, uh, it doesn't make uh, a change. So my uh, question is, how can we ex uh, explain that for them, that everything we do is, uh, d does a difference? Well, I, I, I get your, your question very well, and it's raised towards me quite sometimes. I like to answer with a analogy, and my analogy is your body consists 70% of water, and it has quite a surface. If you would stretch the skin of your body somewhere, it has quite a surface. Our, uh, even our intestines are very long. They could go, could go all the way to the moon. What I want to say here is that if our body, one little element, let's say a tooth in our body does hurt, every, every other function of our body will actually focus on just mitigating that aching tooth. And so the argument of small countries or of countries that feel they have other massive problems and their effort is, doesn't make a difference. For me, it's the analogy of the aching tooth makes a difference to the whole body. It does. It really does. Because that's exactly what small countries can do. They, they can contribute their share in proportion to, the, to, to what the challenge is at hand and in proportion to what they're actually emitting. But plastic, we all know plastic is, is a problem around the globe. Uh, when I have traveled to Palestine, when I traveled in the region to your beautiful countries, I, I do see plastic all over the place. And I, I sense that making a small difference gets rid of the, of the aching tooth, at least for your own vicinity. And my argument would be small things make a difference as much as the tooth to the body. Thank you. So, um, uh, Ahmad, before moving to you and giving you the mic, uh, Salim Ola is asking if UNESCO can support initiatives to convince education publishers such as Oxford, uh, Macmillan, and Cambridge in including ESDs in their curriculum and how you can do that. Actually, we cannot convince, but what we do, we do a lot of awareness and we do support the member states in the Arab countries on related to SDG 4 and including 4.7. So I was working with the ministries of education and other related ministries in supporting that initiative for integrating uh, the sustainable development goals into the education system and monitoring the progress of that one in. So this is what we do. And in addition to that one, like what we do webinars and we do a lot of documents related to that one in, and we are ready to support any actually on that field as much as we can. 
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Salim, again. Um, so, uh, Ahmad, uh, you will have, I think, you please go on with your question. Yeah, all right. So, thank you for the very informative session. Uh, my question is, uh, how can we educate youth in Africa about climate? Which actions or initiatives uh, can be done to mobilize the youth to act in their local countries for climate change? Um, did you hear me? Yes, we, uh, should, I, okay. should I answer to that one? I can give you very practical examples. As Ban Ki-moon Center, what we do is we are supporting scholars and we are supporting fellows and we are support, we call them global citizen scholars. Mm -hmm. We call them global citizen fellows. And also we have a whole mentorship program where we are allotting one mentor with a mentee. And all of these systems, we are entrusting with humongous tasks. Our tasks that we give to them is co-create mentor and mentee or scholars with their circle of friends or fellows who are coming for a training to Vienna create a so-called SDG micro-project. And these SDG micro-projects, some of them um, are on the, in the environmental sphere, others are, as mentioned before, in the migration sphere, yet others are in water and sanitation, which also belongs to environment, yet others are on gender equality. The projects that have come out from our, from our scholars were very informed about the local idiosyncrasies because we would not be able to judge as Ban Ki-moon Center what is right for Ghana, what is right for Nigeria, what is right for the city of Accra in Ghana, what is right for Somalia. So you get my point, the local knowledge is with the local people. And therefore we encourage to all of our scholars, all of our fellows, spot a problem. And the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. And I'm not only talking here about business opportunity, which also stands true most of the time, but the bigger the opportunity to make a change. So spot the problem, um, frame it for yourself in a way that you know what is the niche that you can contribute to and try to make a difference. And what we have seen with the so-called SDG micro projects where, was that sometimes it was blogs that were started by three gifted writers and the blogs turned into a whole youth movement. Other times we, we saw one guy starting to pick up and starting like to pick up uh, waste and starting a recycling program in his school. And in the meantime, Alassan, one of our scholars, is the leader of Ghana Recycle Up of a whole campaign that is very much tailor-made to his context. We could never have prescribed that. So I think the power is already with the people. And sometimes what is, what is missing is the sense of entitlement or the sense of rolling up the sleeves. Sometimes the big name is missing. We are helping with the moment you're associated to the Ban Ki-moon Center, people are paying attention and become aware. So this is serious what, what young people are doing. And if they get speaking opportunities with not only mentors, but also for raising funds with big development corporations or even with own governmental representatives or UNESCO. UNESCO is doing an incredible job of showcasing African young rebels and revolutionaries and, and global citizens who are really making differences, sometimes with SDG micro projects that are growing into medium or even macro projects. So we want to see more of that. Thank you so much, Monica. Wafa, I would love to know if you have anything to add. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, well, as African uh, <laughs> African uh, um, women, I I believe and I think um, the African uh, uh, young African they are one of the most affected uh, um, young people of climate change. So it's not an option to to fight against climate change since we are living it. And this this year, and uh, unfortunately, our generation is living the climate change with the high temperature and the uh, the shortage of uh, water resources and, and everything. So so we are in position to fight against climate change. Uh, each one of us from um, his own uh, uh, position. 
um, I really uh, uh, recall um, uh, the Arab um, uh, the Arab uh, Youth Network uh, that was supported of with uh, with UNESCO. Um, that all of us were, were we were um, young uh, uh, from the African region, the North African region, and the. the um, uh, Asia or uh, everything that uh, we started already our initiative. So I believe each African uh, citizens, let's say, must uh, start his own initiative without waiting for uh, with waiting with, for for no one. For example, I started my own uh, club in the university. We, we should start it in schools and our communities. Uh, in order to fight uh, against climate change for us and for the future generation in Africa and the other uh, regions also. Amazing. Um, so basically, I think we are done with all what we had in terms of content. I want to thank you all for uh, accepting uh, being part of this, uh, you being an example because you were a previous um, uh, attendee for the workshop and uh, look where you are now working on action plans with municipalities. Um, as well, Monica, thank you so much for giving us such a global uh, vision of the whole approach with Ban Ki-moon and all the work you are doing. And I think guys, it is really, uh, uh, I'm not gonna say a must, but it is worth it to go and check the drawdown uh, project. I, I shared with you the, I shared with you the, the link. Uh, ah, apparently, you still have uh, Livon want to ask something. It's you're gonna be the last for tonight. It's already uh, nine, so please uh, do it quickly. Uh, you raise your hand. So, go. thank you so much, Monica, and thank you so much, uh, ODD and uh, UNESCO. Uh, and I would like to pack the question in the chat room. My idea to spread uh, awareness, it's important to make more mobilization, organizing meeting with community to keep the environment. In. The action is uh, uh, the country's take is to, to save the planet. Uh, first, stopping tree cutting, creating more tree, using gas instead of charcoal. And, uh, as you know, Monica, and, and climate change is a big issue. And uh, Somalia is the front line of climate change. Uh, how the climate change affects the floods? As you know, many countries in sub-Saharan Africa are facing now um, floods that cause it to displace more thousands of people and, and kill it more. How the climate change affects flooding. Thank you. So, Monica, uh, how climate change affects, I did catch the last word. Uh, climate, how climate change affects. Can you repeat the, your last word, the uh, bomb, please? Can you, Livan, would you kindly repeat the, just the last question, the how climate change affects, and I understood Gladys, but that doesn't make sense, how climate change affects? Yes, the question is, is uh, how the climate change affects the floods, uh, the returning floods. Uh, the floods? So now, uh, the floods? floods, yeah. Floods, yeah. Yeah, uh, climate change, of course, has many effects. One of them is floods. Another one is uh, landslides. Another one is droughts. Um, am I an expert on Somali agriculture? I'm not. I, I can only again point you to very good research that has been done in the sub-Saharan context by the, the center that I mentioned before, the Global Center on Adaptation. I do know that Africa is particularly hard struck, even more sort of fast. Uh, we will see the, the, the climate change ripple effects on small island states. They are fighting a hard battle, are hardly heard. 
but um, I have to say, Liban, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not an expert on, on your particular context, but I can gladly link you to people who will probably give you better answers than I can on this subject. Okay, so, um, by the way, um, they were asking if you can share the, the presentation, Monica. With oh, you. absolutely. Yes, please. So the presentation, Gladly, I can share that. I will share it with other and, and you guys can hopefully sure. distribute it to, to whoever is interested or deposit it somewhere where people can retrieve the material. And yes, please spread the word. Okay, uh, so for those asking if it will be, if the session will be repeated, I can tell you no. Repeated uh, the same, of course not, but if we are recording and you will post it on our Facebook page, same as we did for the previous, uh, one and we will share with you the presentation. Uh, some people are sharing uh, opinions as uh, Muhammad Yassin. Uh, if you want to read it, guys, thank you for this. Thank you for your engaging, for being engaged in, uh, within, within us the whole uh, session. Um, thank you again. <laughs> I'm going to wrap it up now. Thank you again, Muna. Thank you again, Wafa. And we'll see you guys uh, next Tuesday. And uh, hopefully, we, we added something. Uh, uh, for your action plans, and uh, we show we, we had the, the opportunities to show you not only like speaking of climate change and what does it mean, but to go more into the concrete examples and action plans within the Arab region and to zone a bit out within the global citizenship approach. Uh, thank you so much, and have a great night. Ciao. Bye.